So in the last class, we stopped a little bit early because we ran out of class time, but we still had one more, like one and a half more concepts to cover in this section. So this section was all about solving quadratic equations. And we talked about how to solve quadratics by uh, extracting roots using that square root property. Um, and that was pretty much it. It was just the easier ones with the square root property and then the more difficult ones with the square root property. I'm trying to find my note bag in here. Oh, we got one more to admit. Um, so I believe we got through, oh, and the zero factor property. That was the first one, okay? But we still have two more left and that is the quadratic formula, which is gonna become like your best friend in this class. And then um, another iteration of that uh, quadratics with substitution idea that we saw back in R.4. So we'll kind of see it again, we'll get another practice problem um, to go over, okay? So for this um, concept, this quadratic formula, we skipped over what was called completing the square, okay? And so what the completing the square does is it essentially turns an equation that looks like this, right? Just a regular quadratic equation. And then it turns it into something like these. Oops, you can't see them, but like C and F, okay? Now we don't cover that process of how to turn that quadratic into um, that perfect squared form. That's called completing the square. Um, however, if you use that same concept and you never actually plug in numbers for these coefficients, you just leave those letters random as A, B, and C, you can solve the problem by completing the square and then extracting the roots. And coincidentally, it turns out that the solutions look like this after all of the algebra, okay? Now, again, we don't cover completing the square, right? And we're, I'm definitely not gonna cover it just to prove that this quadratic formula is true, okay? The way we'll uh, basically prove that it's true is once we use it to find our answers, we'll basically just plug in our answers and see if it worked out, okay? Um, so we'll just verify. And I don't usually do that for every problem, uh, but I will do it for this first one. The second one, it becomes a little bit more complex, <laughs> even though it says complex, um, because it'll have imaginary solutions, okay? And right now, our knowledge on imaginary numbers is very limited, okay? So I definitely won't be checking these answers, but as long as we're following all the steps correctly, we, we still should... Uh, know that that answer is correct, okay? But I will show you with this one that doesn't have imaginaries that it does check out. So the first thing that we have to observe is that before I can use the formula, I do have to have my, my uh, trinomial equal to zero. So this quadratic needs to equal zero before I can identify what A, B, and C are, okay? So in this example, I don't have it equal to zero. So I would have to manipulate this equation to make it equal to zero. Does anybody have an idea of what I would need to do to the equation to make it equal to zero? Now Brandon's uh, you usually- have to add two? Yes, yes, you have to add two, great, thank you. Brandon's usually the one that answers all the questions and he's not gonna be here today. So we will need the rest of you guys to chime in. But thanks, thanks, I appreciate that. So yeah, so do the opposite of minus two, right? And add two. So then when I do that, I'll have x squared minus four x, a plus two, and then negative two plus two gives me that zero that we needed, right? So now that I have the zero, now is where you can identify your a, b, and c. Okay, so before I do that, I definitely want to make this invisible one coefficient visible. So then what would A be? A is always the coefficient in front of X squared. Okay. 
So that would just be a one? Mm -hmm. Exactly, perfect. And now this one's a little bit trickier, but what's the coefficient in front of X? Uh, negative four. You got it. That's like the tricky one, right? You do have to include that sign if um, somebody is sending me a private message. So give me one second. Okay, there we go. Um, yes, you have to include the sign with it. So it is going to be a negative four. And likewise, what is the constant going to be? Oh, Brendan did make it. Yay. Uh, so the constant. Two. Yeah, positive two. You got it. Good, good, good. So then now what we're just going to do is we're going to plug it into this formula, okay? And you do have the formula available um, when you take the test. So you do have formulas that will be on there. It will tell you this exactly. It'll say, if you have this, then your x's will equal these values, okay? So I'm just going to plug them in. Now, I highly recommend that you always use parentheses when you plug in numbers, especially when there's signs and squares involved. Um, I have had people who are very adamant about not listening to my tips, <laughs> and then they end up with the wrong answers, okay? So you have, and the reason being is that there's a difference between this and this. If you just recall, um, signs and squares and all that information. See, this one means to take the negative three and actually square the negative three. And a negative times a negative would give me a positive nine. Whereas this, if you try to plug in negative three in here and all you write in your calculator is negative three squared because it says X squared and you're plugging in negative three. So you put the square on top. This in the calculator and in mathematics in general, means three, I'm sorry, which means the opposite of three squared, which tells the calculator again, it's three times three, but because you have that negative on the outside, it's actually negative nine. So notice that the values are not the same, right? And so that's why it matters. If you try to plug in, this negative four right there for B, and you don't put it in parentheses, you will be having the wrong answers, okay? So I just wanted to point that out, the difference of when you use parentheses versus when you don't. The correct answer when you're plugging in numbers is to always use parentheses. So you'll notice my little setup there. I just rewrote the whole quadratic formula, but everywhere there was a letter other than X, I just put a, a bubble, right? A parentheses bubble. And so now I'm gonna fill in with the correct numbers. So since B is supposed to go in this spot, that's the negative four. Since B is supposed to get squared over here, that's again, the negative four. Then behind the four, inside the radical is supposed to be A, which is one, and then C, which was positive two, and then in the denominator, it's supposed to be two times A. So in this case, two times one. Now you are limited into how you enter this in your calculator, because if you try to enter it too much, like if you try to put the whole thing in the calculator, one, there's no symbol like this in your calculator. So you can't plug that symbol in, okay? And two, if this stuff in here is a negative at the end of everything, then you're gonna have an imaginary and your calculator won't tell you that. It'll just tell you error, okay? So what I highly recommend is that you always type in what's inside the radical first, okay? Just figure out what's in the house and then you can go from there. And then these little things, you could pretty much do just all on your own without the calculator, okay? So I'm gonna type in parentheses negative four squared minus four times one times two. Notice that what I entered looks exactly like what I have on my paper, right? So I'm gonna hit enter and it tells me it's eight. So I'm going to do a double negative is going to be a positive four. And now I know that I'm dealing with the square root of eight and then two times one 
is just two. Then what I highly recommend, if this is negative, you're gonna take the little I out here, okay? But since it's not negative, I'm gonna plug this in my calculator second. So I'm just gonna type in the square root of eight, the whole thing. So the four stays put, that symbol stays put, and the two downstairs stays put. I'm just gonna replace the square root of eight with two square root of two. Uh, what would we do if the eight was negative? Like You would take the I out, right? The negative would come out as an I, and then you could simplify the square root of eight. We will have an example of it right here, next one. Okay. Um, and then once you have that, this numerator is as simplified as it's gonna get, okay? But the fraction as a whole can be simplified. So what we do is if both of these are gonna be over two, is we can put them individually over two. So notice that I split that fraction, right? Each piece of the numerator goes over that same denominator. And then you could type this in your calculator to see if it actually simplifies. Four over two, and it does, it's just a two. Keep that little symbol in there and type that in there. As weird as it is, just type it in. And then downstairs, a two. And it simplifies, it's just a square root of two. However, in the computer, when you're typing in your numbers in uh, my math lab, it actually would tell you to type in two separate answers with the comma. So you will be typing in two plus square root of two, and then the other one, which is two minus square root of two. So these two are your solutions. So essentially what that means is that if I were to take this number and plug it in for X here and here, the value at the end should be negative two after all my computation. Similarly, if I took this weird number and plugged it in for X here and here, after all the computation, it should equal negative two. And so since I don't have I's, I can check it in the calculator. And the weird part about, <clears throat> excuse me, the I's is that you can't check those in your calculator, unfortunately. So in this problem, I'm gonna do parentheses and I'm gonna try the positive version. Two plus square root of two, get out from under the house and then close that parentheses and I'm gonna square it. Minus four parentheses, two plus square root of two, get out of the house and then close the parentheses. So again, remember I'm plugging in a number, it has to go in parentheses when I plug it in, right? So that weird x value squared minus four times that same weird x value. And when I hit enter, it should equal negative two. And it does, okay? Now I can check the other one, which is the same thing, but with a minus in between instead of a plus, right? I'm a little lazy. People always ask me, what made you major in math? And it was literally because I'm lazy. Um, Math just came easy to me. And so I was like, well, then that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so I like to copy it. So all I did was go up and highlight and hit enter. And then it copied it. But I can move my little cursor around. Oops, I shouldn't, I didn't mean to delete that. But I can move my little cursor around and change my pause, my plus signs into minus signs. So I just go right over my plus sign and I'm going to enter a minus. Okay, and I can do that for both. I have to do it for both because the number I'm plugging in now is two minus square root of two. So once that's all in there exactly the way I want it, I'm gonna hit enter and hopefully the answer is negative two. So yeah, both of those checked out. I plugged in those X values here and it did actually equal negative two. So those are the two solutions. So get more practice with this. Again, you will have that formula. You will have the precursor, right? This is what it needs to look like before you can use the formula. So on this one, we have a bit of an issue though, because now we have two people on the wrong side, right? 
here's your x squared guy, and all your terms are supposed to be with the x squared. Now, I'm actually going to do this problem two times because I want to show you that it doesn't matter which way your brain works, you will still get the same correct answer. Okay. So, the first way I'm going to do it is if I had decided to move both of these guys to the left side. If I chose to move these over so that this side had the zero, I would have to do minus x and plus four, which means on the other side of the equation, I would have to do minus x and plus four, right? Whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. So then my equation would become two x squared minus x plus four, and then that would cancel and that would cancel. So I would have nothing on the right-hand side. Now, I could have also chosen to take the original. And since I had two people on this side, some people's brains might have said, well, let me just move the one guy over there. And so then you would have had to minus 2x squared on both sides. And so then you would have nothing on the left. And over here, you would have the negative 2x squared in the front, a positive x next, and then the minus 4 just to keep consistent with the order, right? It has to be the squares, then the x's, and then the constants. So notice that they look different, but it doesn't matter what they look like. We're still gonna get the same answer for both, okay? So for here, um, I'll do it in green. My A is actually positive two. My B is going to be a negative invisible one. And then my C is a positive four. Whereas over here, the A is actually a negative two. B is actually a positive one. And then C is actually a negative four. So all opposite signs, right? All the signs are completely opposite. So let's use the formula for the first one. Negative B, so that's negative one plus or minus b squared, which is negative one again, minus four times a times c, all over two times a. I'm gonna do the same setup over on the other side, okay? So negative b plus or minus square root b squared, so one squared, minus four times a times c, all over two times a. Now remember the three steps on how to, you know, condense these down. First thing is I just work with what's inside the house, okay, just the inside. So over here, I'm going to type in parentheses. It's too convoluted. Let me clear it up. Parentheses, negative one, close it, square. Minus four, parentheses two, parentheses four. So when I hit enter, it gives me that negative number. Double negative is a positive. And that turned out to be negative 31 on the inside. And then two times two is four. Let's go see what it looks like on the other side. So here it's just basically saying negative one. And then we'll see what we get when we plug that in the calculator. So parentheses one squared minus four, negative two in parentheses and negative four in parentheses. And we get the same negative 31. And then in the bottom, two times negative two is actually negative four. So they look different still. The only thing they really matches is what's inside that house. So before I can plug the house, the whole house in the calculator, I have to take the negative out. Because what happens when I try to do square root of negative 31? The calculator just tells me error. Okay. But we know from the last class, right? We talked about if we take this out, 
it becomes an I, okay? So this really is one plus or minus I squared 31. And the same thing here, negative one plus or minus I square root of 31. Now here I would try to do the square root of 31, but you'll notice it doesn't simplify. It just came back exactly as it was, right? Which means, I mean, you tried, but it does not simplify. The only thing you can do now is to split the fraction. Put one over four, and then put i squared of 31 over four. And if I try to type this in, one over four, it does not simplify. So it stays one over four. And then here, you need to write the i on the side. When we get to r.5, you'll know why I have to write the i on the side. But you should try to simplify this fraction without the i. And when I type that in there, it stays exactly the same. So it does not simplify. But I do have to write the i on the side. So it's like that fraction times i. And if I were to actually multiply them, it is this. So I'm just rewriting it different. And then again, the computer, once it's final answer, was separated with the comma. So you would essentially have one over four plus this weird fraction with the I on the side. And then you would have one over four minus the weird fraction with an I on the side. And this is what the final answer would look like. Now I mentioned that if I had done it the other way, moving over the other terms, it should come out the same, okay? And it does. If I split, oops, I forgot my man negative. If I split this fraction, this one's a little bit weird to talk about, but I am gonna talk about it. You get one over, actually negative one over negative four, right? I had to mess around with that to get it in there to look exactly like it did on the paper, okay? So negative one over negative four, when I hit enter, it does tell me that that's the same as just one fourth. Here's where it gets weird. If you take a positive divided by a negative, you end up with a negative. If you take a negative divided by a negative, you end up with a positive. So this negative down here, doesn't really change this. It just kind of flips it over, but that's not how you write the symbol. So this plus will become a negative and that negative will become a plus, but you don't ever write the symbol like that, okay? But that's essentially what's happening, but you don't write it like this. This is informal. It has to be like this, this plus or minus. This means plus or minus as well. And we already know from previous that this fraction part without the signs is not going to simplify. So we stick the I on the side and the square root of 31 over four does not simplify. So I prefer to do it this way only because I don't end up with this weird negative thing at the bottom. So what I always do is I always look at my equation and I always move things around so that my A value is positive. Because if I can move it around so that my A value is positive, then I'll never have a negative downstairs and never have to worry about this plus or minus stuff, okay? So for me personally, I saw X squared was positive already. Then that would have told me, move these guys over to where he's at because he's already ready to go, okay? Whereas if it were, were negative x squared, then I would want to move it over so it could become positive x squared, okay? So just keep that in mind. I mean, it, that's the thing with math, right? Is that there's these rules, but then as long as you're not breaking the rules, you have a choice of which way to go sometimes, okay? So it's very interesting. So just FYI, as I continue to do problems, if I ever come up with a quadratic, I'm always gonna try to manipulate it so that my X squared term is positive. 
Okay. I will never do this and make it negative. Never, never, never. That's just how I like to do it. And I'm going to be consistent. Okay. Um, but this looks exactly like this, doesn't it? So if I were to split them, it would look like the same exact two answers. Okay. I just wanted to make that point that they do come out the same. I just don't like negatives downstairs. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the next page. We do not cover completing the square, okay? Um, we just don't cover it at all, so you don't have to worry about these problems. This would have been the process of turning that into something like this, where it had x plus or minus a number, but we don't go over this process, so we won't be covering these kinds of problems. However, we didn't have any cubic problems in this um, section either, but I did see a problem like this somewhere in the assignment, okay? And I wanted to talk through that one. Um, so that way, if you saw something like that in your, well, I mean, you're gonna see something like that in your homework assignment, you kind of have an idea of what to do with it, okay, how to approach it. So this is the quadratic, although it might not look like it the way it is right now. Um, it is one because as soon as I try to distribute all of this, I'm going to end up with an x squared. Okay. And so that is going to be my beginning step is to actually distribute this stuff. So I'm going to take my 2x and multiply it by all of that second parentheses. Then I'm going to take my minus one and multiply it by everything in that second parentheses. And the other side, I just wrote down. So then now when I distribute this, that's going to be 6x squared. When I multiply those, that's going to be positive 4 with an x. Oh, when I multiply those, a negative times a positive makes negative 3x. And then negative 1 times positive 2 makes negative 2. Now here, I don't have it equal to 0. But I do see that my x squared is already positive. So that means I'm going to keep him there and just move this guy over, OK? So for two reasons, I'm moving this one over. One is there's only one guy to move over, right? Versus moving over four people the other way. And two, it's already positive. So I definitely want to move this guy over. So 5x, take away 5x means I have nothing on this side anymore. And over here, I have the 6x squared and I have the negative two. But I see all of these x's. Those are all what they call like terms, right? So I have to combine them. And then that would give me what goes in the middle, the x. So I'm going to do positive 4, take away 3, take away 5, and it gives me negative 4. So I'm actually going to have minus 4x here. It looks weird because it's spaced out, but whatever. I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> So then now we're going to identify our A, our B, and our C. So the A is going to be 6, the B is going to be negative 4, and the C is going to be negative 2. Now from here, remember the old way we were doing it? We had to factor that, right, using the AC method. And then after we factored it, we would have to set each factor equal to 0. So there's a lot more process and thinking involved when you're doing the uh, solving a quadratic by factoring, OK? Um, I'm not going to do it by factoring. I'm just going to do it using the quadratic formula. Factoring takes way too long. You have to do the A times the C, find the magic numbers that give you negative 4 when you combine them, right? then write the two bubbles, then set each bubble equal to zero, and then solve each of those little baby equations, okay? It's a long process. But 
using the quadratic formula, it's actually a faster process, okay? So typically, unless my directions specifically tell me to factor it, I always personally just do the quadratic formula, okay? So as soon as I see trinomial like that, and you didn't tell me which way you wanted me to solve it, <laughs> I just always go quadratic formula, okay? And again, you will have the formula available. So I'm just going to write it right here in case you forgot it. So that when I start filling all the numbers in, you don't think I'm crazy and just making stuff up. There we go. Well, you probably think that anyway, but it's okay. Okay, so I am going to do negative and B itself is a negative form. Then something squared, but B is being squared and B is a negative four. Minus four A, which is a six, times C, which is a negative two. Oops, you can't see that. There we go. All over two times A, which is a six. Now keep in mind, see how the bar goes over all of that or under all of this? I have seen a common error happen where people just put the bar over here and only put the 2a underneath this. And that's not true. The 2a goes under all of that thing, okay? So all of that negative b stuff all the way to the end of the house should all be your numerator, okay? So then this and this negative negative is going to be positive four. I'll figure out what number is in there. And two times six, that's just 12, right? So let's figure out what number is on the inside. So let me clear this. Parentheses, negative four squared, minus four, parentheses, six, parentheses, negative two. Looks exactly like it does on my paper. So I'm going to hit enter. And I get 64. Now that's positive. So I can just figure out what the square root of 64 is. And I don't have to put any I's or anything like that. And it's just eight without a house. So this becomes four plus or minus eight without a house. There is no house on that eight, right? So we get this. And I'm gonna follow the same processes as I did before just because I like to be consistent. I'm gonna separate this and figure out what we got from there. So four over 12 actually simplifies to one third. And then eight over 12 actually simplifies to two thirds. And we know in the computer, they want us to do the plus and then the minus separately. However, I'm putting another equal sign because in the previous problems, we either had an I over here or we had a square root over here. And this time, coincidentally, I don't have an I or a square root, which means these guys are like terms. So I can add them together. And these guys are like terms, so I can subtract them. And if, you, if you're great at fractions, do it in your head, it's faster, right? But if you're not great at fractions, by all means, please type it in the calculator. So one over three plus two over three and hit enter. This one turns out to be positive one. And then if I go back, because again, I'm lazy, change that to a minus sign and it gives me negative one third. And so these are the two answers. Now you can only actually add them and actually subtract them if this guy does not have any i's or any little square roots left over, okay? Notice in the previous page, where'd my paper go? This one had square roots, right? So I can't add the roots and the regular numbers together. You just can't do that. And then this one had eyes, and you definitely cannot add real numbers and imaginary numbers together, okay? 
So when they have those radicals or those eyes, you cannot actually add and subtract. But if it coincidentally comes out with no radicals and no eyes, then yay, you can put them together. Okay. Now this is a bunch of letters. <laughs> and then they basically tell you to solve for the letter. Um, like here, they want you to solve for D. And since it's squared, you're basically solving a quadratic. But we don't solve quadratic equations when all they have is letters. Okay, we don't do that in this class. So I just put not covered in this class and we crossed it out. There are no problems in your homework that have all variables. Okay, they will look like these with the X's and the numbers. Um, dum, dum, dum. And then they talk about discriminant, all of this good stuff. We don't do that either. So none of this is covered um, in this section. So we are done actually, we finished 1.4. So the only piece we were missing was that quadratic formula. So today we were supposed to cover 1.6, um, but I wanted to make sure that we finished this first before we go into 1.6, right? Uh, so we will probably be using this quadratic formula a little bit more, um, but I definitely wanted you to have the three examples of like where the answer still has radicals, but no imaginaries, where the answer has imaginaries, and then where the answers didn't have any radicals or imaginaries, okay? And so you kind of have like a basis for us to keep talking, okay? Um, so when we go to 1.6, 1.6 is about solving other types of equations, okay? And so sometimes there's like a step to manipulate it, to turn it into a quadratic equation or a linear equation, okay? So we're basically gonna cover the different kinds of equations you'll see, and then how is it that we turn them into quadratic equations or linear equations, okay? So 1.6, this is what a linear equation looks like when the whole equation just has x and a bunch of numbers, okay? No x squared, no x cubed, nothing crazy like that, just x, okay? And then we just talked about what a quadratic looks like, and that's if you do have an x squared in the whole thing, right? You could have this term of x, you could have a constant, but most importantly, it's a quadratic if you have an x squared. Okay, so what are the other kinds of equations that we might see? Um, there are three basic ones, okay? One of them is called rational equations. And basically what it means is you have fractions in your equations, okay? So there's all these X's involved, but now the X's are in fractions, okay? That is called the rational equation. So we'll talk about those and how to deal with them, okay? Then, an application of the fraction equations is the work rate problems, okay? Um, I think we have one example of these, so we'll cover those. You need a specific formula, and we'll talk about that when we get to it, okay? Then you have another kind of equations, which is equations with radicals. So they could have square roots, they could have cube roots, fourth roots, so on and so forth, okay? But they are with the little houses. So we could have equations with little houses. We could also have equations with what are called rational exponents. Rational just means fraction, okay? So you might have problems where they have exponents that look like fractions. And in order for me to solve those kinds of problems, we actually have to convert them into radicals. Since I already will learn how to solve radicals, if I can convert the rational exponents into radicals, then I can apply the same processes. And then the last one is the equations in quadratic form. We did cover one of those um, in R.4, but another one's gonna come up at the end of this section. I thought it was at the end of the last section, but it's actually at the end of this section. We're also gonna end up talking about um, this word right here, proposed solution. And that is very important because 
what happens with these kinds of equations with the, ra the fraction equations and the radical equations? And then these are just radical equations in disguise, okay? With all three of those kinds of equations is you could do all the algebra and all the math, like the arithmetic correctly, just perfect. You did everything perfect and you solve it and you might end up with an answer or an extra answer that just simply doesn't work, okay? You try to go check your answer and it's not correct. It's just not a correct answer, okay? That can happen. So what they did was they gave them names. So if you're solving the equation and you get two answers or one answer, whatever, however many answers you get, okay? Those solutions are called proposed solutions. So these are the solutions that you're like, I think these are the answers, okay? But then from there, you have to actually check them and determine whether or not they are actual solutions or, it's another weird word, extraneous solutions. And extraneous just means extra, okay? So you did all the math right, but you had this extra answer that just doesn't work, okay? So once you have your proposed solutions, they're either going to be the actual solution or they're going to be extraneous. And I don't even know if I'm spelling that word right. I don't like that word. Let me see. I have a feeling that my second E should be an A, but let me double check. It is supposed to be an A, I thought so. So this little guy right there should be an A. Well, that makes sense, right? Extra. And you can only tell whether or not they're actual solutions or extraneous solutions if you check them, okay? So once we do all of our work and we figure out what the answers are, the proposed answers, we will check them and see if they're an actual answer or just an extra answer. Okay, so first we're gonna start with rational equations. And to be honest, we only have 30 minutes left, so we might only be able to get through the rational equations, but that's okay. I gave us time for the next class period to cover 1.6 as well. So I would be super happy if we can get through these two since they're kind of the same. This is just basically a word problem with fractions. Um, if we can get through those two topics, then we can cover all these other ones in the next um, class period, okay? So for definition, a rational equation is an equation that has a rational expression for one or more terms. And I do need you to remember that rational literally is a... Um, fancy word for fraction, okay? So essentially a rational equation is an equation that has fractions in it, okay? If you see fractions in your equation, it's a rational equation. Now to solve a rational equation, what you do is, is you multiply each, so this is the trick, you multiply each side by the lowest common denominator, and then what happens is that that causes you to simplify the equation, each term. So if I'm gonna multiply each term by this lowest common denominator, I just say LCD for short. If I multiply every term by this LCD, what should happen is that all the denominators should go away. And then what I'm left with will either end up being a linear equation after I simplify it all, or what I'll be left with is a quadratic equation. And both of those we should know how to solve, okay? We're practicing. So we'll get some more practice, of course, today. Now, the I know fractions was way back when and not everybody's fantastic with them. So I'm gonna definitely be talking out this fraction stuff. Um, but when you're trying to find the lowest common denominator, you do have to think of this, okay? So you figure out, what is in on you know each denominator, and then any factors that they 
that either two of them have in common or all three of them have in common, but any factors that are in common only get listed once, okay? Then if you have any what are called distinct factors, means different, okay? Any other factors that are not in common with anything, those also are included in the common denominator, okay? So we'll talk about this a little bit as I keep working on these things, okay? So for this first one, and what is that writing? Oh, it's erasable. I don't know what all this scribble was, but it's just imprints from the other page. Okay, so if I first look at example one, part A, and see, look, it tells you, be sure to check all your proposed solutions. Always, always, always. That's the only way we can tell if they're an actual solution or an extraneous solution. So I'm gonna look at this problem. This one doesn't have a denominator, but you can always put a whole number over one. And now it does if you wanted to write that in there, but it's not necessary. So just looking at my denominators, okay? My LCD here, would be anything that the two denominators have in common. However, this is one number and this is another number and they are not the same thing. So they don't have anything in common. So I won't have any factors of this form in my LCD, but these are different from one another. So I will have both of those as part of my distinct factors. So they didn't have any factors in common, but they did have these two distinct denominators, okay? So that whole thing is my LCD. So what I do is I write three X minus one over three. And me personally, I like to put the tops and the bottoms in parentheses, that's just me. And then remember what the solution, the, trick was is to multiply every single term by this LCD. So bear with me as I write this out. This is probably gonna be the longest, tedious, annoying step. But because I'm teaching the class, I have to write it out. I cannot just do it in my head. You might be able to eventually do this in your head, but for me, I'm going to write everything out. So all I've done so far is identified the lowest common denominator and then multiplied each term by that common denominator. And just like we mentioned, the whole purpose of doing that is so that this denominator can cancel and this denominator can cancel. And now I don't have any more denominators anymore. So you turn the equation into an equation that is no longer a fraction equation. Now, I don't know, I'm pretty sure this is a quadratic, but I don't know for sure, okay? So it might be a quadratic, it might simplify down to a linear. I don't know yet, but I'm definitely going to figure it out by simplifying this big equation. So the first thing I'm gonna do is set this up to distribute. So three X times the X minus one, minus one times the X minus one. This one I can do, that's just six X. Here, I'm gonna multiply those as well and I get three X. So all I did was these two and those two. And then of course, took this to distribute and then this one to distribute. This is all I've done so far. I have by no means finished my multiplication yet. Now I'm going to do this distributing and even this distributing. So here I get three X squared. Here I get minus three X minus one X a negative and a negative would be positive one and the minus six X just comes down. Here, when I multiply, 
I get 3x squared and then negative 3x. That's really long. The right hand side, I cannot combine. They're not like terms. This is an x squared and that's an x. So you can't combine any of those. But on the left hand side, I can combine some of them, right? I can combine the negative 3x, the negative 1x, and the negative 6x. So let me see. Um, negative 3 minus 1 minus 6 is negative 10x. And then this constant is the only constant. So it's just going to come down plus 1. Now, it is a quadratic right now. Um, only because I foresee what's going to happen, but it's a quadratic right now. So ideally, you would want to move over your x squareds to a place where your x squareds would be positive. However, it really doesn't matter whether I move this one over there or that one over there, because they're the same thing, aren't they? So regardless of which one you were intending to move, you're going to have to minus 3x squared to move it. And then you'll notice it's just going to basically cancel here and cancel there. And so you're left with this equation. The sky is still here. It just came down. Okay. But notice that now you don't have any more x squareds, right? So it wasn't actually simplified down to a quadratic. It is a linear. And when you're solving linears, your biggest goal is just to get all the x's on one side and all the constants on quote unquote the other side. So you just want x's on one side and constants on the other, and then you can just divide by the coefficient of x. So I see this constant here, and it's the only one. So I'm gonna leave that alone and actually kick the x over to the other side so he could be with the other x, okay? So instead of minus 10x, I'm gonna add 10x. So that negative 10x plus 10x wipe each other out. I still have my positive one and negative three plus 10 is positive seven x. And then if I wanna solve completely for x, I will divide by the coefficient of x on both sides. So these will simplify or reduce and give me just x. And then I have one over seven because that does not simplify as my proposed solution, okay? So this is the answer that I think is the answer, but I don't know for sure yet until I try to check it, okay? And so it's gonna be really weird to check it. If you have this calculator, I highly recommend that you check it in this way versus trying to actually type it in when you plug it in. Okay, I don't want to type in my calculator a big fraction, then three times a smaller fraction, and then especially over here, because you're going to have a smaller fraction up there and a smaller fraction down here inside of a big fraction. It's just too, too messy. So what I do instead is I say one over seven, and I get to the side of my fraction. Then what I do is I hit this button right here. It says STO. That's a storing button. So I'm going to hit store. And then I could pick whatever variable I want to plug this in for. So I'm just going to hit this button once so that I can store it as X. If you hit it multiple times, it'll change the letter. But I don't ever hit it multiple times. I just hit it once for X, and then that's the letter I choose. Okay. Now, when I hit Enter, what it's going to do in your calculator is it's going to save this variable X as the value of 1 over 7. So every time I type in X, it's plugging in one over seven, okay? And that helps me because then I can just type in this whole fraction, three X minus one over three, go to the side, minus fraction, two X over X minus one. And it looks exactly like it does on the paper. Okay, and when I hit enter, it's gonna plug in the one seventh for me. So I don't have to keep putting in one seventh, one seventh, one seventh in parentheses every time I plug it in either. It automatically does all of that for me. 
So I'm going to hit enter and I get one seventh. It's supposed to equal the X value that you're plugging in. Aren't I plugging in one seventh? Right? So I do get the X value that I was plugging in. So this is an actual solution. Okay. And when it's an actual solution, um, they may just want you to type in one seventh in the box. Or if they ask you for the solution set again, because I noticed some of the problems do that, it's just the one seventh but in squigglies. Okay. So we applied the trick and we simplified everything. And it turned out that we only got one answer. And that answer was a good answer. That does not always happen, but it just happened this time. There will be times where you will get more than one answer. And in that case, it's weird. Both could work, one could work, or neither of them could work. You really have to check, okay? So does anybody have any questions over this one before I go into the other one? Because the other one's going to be different. What am I doing on time? Oh, see, it took me 12 minutes to cover that one. Hopefully I have enough time, but I'm getting worried. It's okay. <laughs> so over here, we look at this one. Same thing. It's an equation that has fractions. So we want to multiply by the common denominator. However, in this situation, look at our denominators. They're exactly the same. So they have this denominator in common which means I only list that X minus two once, okay? And there doesn't happen to be anything else extra in those denominators. So in this case, I don't have any distinct factors. I only had the factor that they had in common and that was it. But I'm gonna still employ that same trick where I'm gonna take every single, and again, I like to put these in parentheses, but that's just me. Mostly when there's two terms, I like to put them in parentheses. When it's just one term, usually I don't, okay? Then I'm gonna multiply by this LCD. Equal sign comes next. My next fraction, again, two terms, so I'm going to put it in parentheses, multiply by my LCD plus two. Again, multiply by my LCD. And so remember the purpose. The purpose is to make the denominators go away. So start scratching off stuff, right? This is going to cancel with that. This is going to cancel with that. There is no denominator here, so this does not cancel at all. All I'm left with here is x. What I'm left with here is just two. And what I'm left with here is two times x minus two. So we'll follow our steps to simplify this. This two is just hanging out. But if I take a positive two and I distribute it, this is gonna be positive two X, and then a positive times a negative is negative, two times two is four. Coincidentally, we still are coming up with linears, okay? There's no X squared in this line. So I still have a linear equation. Well, the goal of linear equations is to get the X's on one side, numbers on the other. These two constants are already on the right-hand side. So then to me, it makes sense to move this one guy over to the left-hand side. So I'm gonna minus two X. So that'll make this one go away from here. And remember, this is one. So one take away two is negative one. So that's how many X's I have, negative one X. And then two take away four is actually negative two. Now that we have x's on one side, constants on the other, you divide both sides by the coefficient of x. And then these guys are going to be gone. 
but negative two divided by negative one is actually positive two. So again, this is a proposed solution. We need to go figure out if it's an actual solution. So since this time x is equal to two, clear all that out, I'm gonna say two store as x and then hit enter so that it can save that x as the value two. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug it into this side and see what I get. So x over x minus two. Now that's all that's on this side. So I'm gonna hit enter. And notice what it tells me, it tells me error, divide by zero. So since this led to an error, And it doesn't matter if the error came from this side or from that side, because ideally what I should have been doing is plugging in the number here and then plugging in the number over here and seeing if the two answers I got were the same, right? You wanna see if they are actually equal. But just by trying to plug it in on this side, I automatically got an error. FYI, if you would have tried to plug it in on this side, you would have also gotten an error, okay? But you only need to get the error once, to make your conclusion, okay? So since this led to an error when checking, x equal to two is not a solution, which means x equal to two is an extraneous solution. Now, I don't think that, I don't think, I don't remember, but I don't think that my math lab asks you for extraneous solutions, but if it did, it would be any of the X values you found that don't check out, okay? If you get an error, it didn't check out. The only way it checks out is if when you plug in the number, the left side equals whatever you get on the right side. Now, I only got one answer, and that answer was bad, right? It wasn't an actual answer. I have no actual answers. So in the computer, you literally just say no solution. Okay, we know we have an extraneous solution, but we don't have any actual solutions that actually work. Similarly, that's the same kind of thing that would happen if we did do all this mess and we ended up with a quadratic and you ended up with two answers from your quadratic. If both of them didn't work, then it would still be no solution. If only one of them worked, then your answer would be that one that worked. Um, and if both worked, well, then your answer would be both of those solutions, okay? Okay, let me see if we have this work problem. No, we don't, we have more of these. Before I get into these, because these do lead to quadratics, okay? We'll go into those in the next class. It'll be a great refresher for the other, for what we were just doing. But I am gonna skip to this because it's not as complicated as the other one, okay? So in order for you to do work rate problems, you have to have this formula and you will be provided the formula on the test, okay? But what this means is it's the time that it took for the first person or object to do a particular job. And then T2 is the time that it took person or object two to do the same job. And then T together is the time that it took the persons, the two people or the two objects to do the same job, but working together. Okay, so in this example three, it says one printer can do a job twice as fast as another printer. Working together, both printers can do that same job in two hours. So how long would it take each printer working alone to do the job? So essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out what T1 and T2 are. 
because you want to know how long each printer took to do it by themselves. The only number that I'm given flat out straight up is the time that it took them to do it together. So I do know that this is going to be two because it took them two hours, right? What I don't know is what to put under these two denominators, okay? But they do give me a hint, okay? So the hint is right here. One printer can do the job twice as fast as another printer. So you've got a slower printer, and then you have the faster printer, right? Now I could use T, but I like X, so I'm gonna use X. So I'm gonna say that the slower printer takes X amount of hours. Well, if the other one can do it twice as fast, then that would be two times the X number of hours, right? And I always try to think back to make sure this is correct. So if I were to just make up a number for X, let's say five hours. So if the slower one were to take five hours, the faster one would take two times that 10 hours. That doesn't make sense, right? If it's faster, it should be taking less hours, not more hours, right? This happens a lot. If you don't go back and make sure that your logic was correct. To be honest, I think these labels are backwards. And then we'll talk it out again. So I think the faster one is like this. And then the slower one is like that. Now let's examine that. If the faster one takes five hours, the slower one would take two times that, so 10 hours. Now that makes sense, okay? So whenever you do this with your letters, make sure that it makes sense. So it doesn't matter which one's which. Um, I'm gonna call this denominator the first one. We'll say that's the um, faster one. And then this one will be the slower one. Now, what is the LCD here? So I see two factors. I see X and I see two. And these two have an X in common. And these two have a two in common. But remember, you only list each one once. They don't have anything else extra outside of X and two. I don't see anything else in my denominators outside of X and two. So my LCD is just gonna be two X. Now this is me being lazy. Instead of rewriting the whole thing, I'm just gonna put the times two X right in there, okay? And remember the point of it was to cancel some stuff, right? So the X will cancel there. Both the two and the X will cancel here. And then here, just the twos will cancel. So what we'll be left with is one times two, which is two, and then one all by itself, and then one times X, which is X. And I can add those, it's just three. So X equals three. Now remember, X is the faster printer. So I'm gonna say that the faster printer takes three hours. Well, according to the relationship between the faster one and the slower one, the slower one should take two times that amount, right? And so then two times three is gonna be six hours, okay? So the slower one took six hours. Now we did not quite finish fractions, okay? So I do have these two examples that we will cover in the next class. And then after we cover these, we'll go into um, the radical ones, okay? Hopefully we have enough time to finish. If we don't, I've mentioned it before, I don't like to rush. So if we get to everything in 1.6 next class, great. If we don't, we can always shift and slide things around to make sure that we have enough time to cover everything. Okay. Does anybody have any questions?
If not, you guys are free to go. I don't want to start another problem. I won't be able to finish it in four minutes. Um, so you guys are free to go. I'll be here for the next four minutes at least. If you do come up with a question, okay? Have Better a good night. day. Yes, you too. Have a good one. I was just going to say that. <laughs>